Previously on the inventory. Now I want whoever it was that poisoned the tea to speak up so we can find out who was behind this. I see how it is. Well, looks like I'll have to find out who did this myself. Name's Freelance. Uncoverer of the Undercover. Seems the Orange has pegged you as some sort of conspirator, and I'm here to prove it, one way or the other. You've got more inside access to the station than I do. You wouldn't happen to have any idea who poisoned my tea. Yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. So anyway, I wake up to hear this strange rumbling. I followed the sound to a door leading to the equipment room, and all I found was this. Uh, yeah, that's <clears throat> definitely poison joke. Are you absolutely sure? Totally has to be. Well, aren't you just a fine piece of work? You are so preoccupied with seeking out enemies that you are neglecting the true enemies that are right in front of you. Those so-called friends of yours? Only they have the access to your tea. It's the only thing that makes sense. <laughs> Dang it. I don't want hardcover's book. It'd tear me a new one if I damage it. What's this? It's a... It's a blue leaf. There, there's got to be a logical explanation to this. There's just no way in a question it could be hardcover. So I came in early this morning before the station opened. I hid myself on the other side of the door and snagged this picture of my camera. Check it out. It's freelance. And now for the continuation of the inventory on KPNY. Let's see what I can have you do today. I think I'll have you wash my fedoras. Oh, and you know what? My clothes could you use this training while you're at it. And you know what? Now that I think about it, I'm really craving some Dutch apple cobbler. But when you go get it, don't don't go to the cakes down the street. They they don't really know how to make a good Dutch apple cobbler, it's its lacking the southern style. When you get it, go to the apple orchard down the road. It, it tastes so much better there. You have got to be kidding me. I refuse to be your indentured servant any longer. Oh, that's okay, fairy tale. You don't have to do anything for me. I'm sure the others will get a kick out of this picture of Fitfire. You will rue the day you found that photograph. You're not the only one here who is capable of carrying out aggressive negotiations. Behold, the genesis of your downfall cover story! <laughs> What's this paper? It looks to be a decade old. Do you not recognize the cover story? It's a copy of the Manhattan Gazette. The front page headline? Mare in the Moon, The Unknown Truth by Cover Story. Where the heck did you get this? I work at the Canterlot Library, you dolt of a cult. We have archives ranging back hundreds of years. It wasn't difficult to ascertain its location. Give me that now! Now, why would I want to do that, hmm? Surely Airwaves already knows the story. Oh, what's this? You never told him? <clears throat> I cover story have uncovered the real reason behind the banishment of Nightmare Moon some 1,000 years ago. The glorious Princess Celestia, with her omnipotent benevolent, banished Nightmare Moon after the brutal and senseless murder of her beloved Princess Luna. The Princess of the Sun relished in her victory over her most hated enemy in a blaze of glory. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure Celestia choked on her cake upon reading that. I'm actually surprised she didn't banish you to the moon. I didn't know that Luna and Nightmare Moon were one and the same with time. The speakers of the sun that I was a part of never really talked about Luna. I was an idiot to think to use their speaker scriptures as a source. Nothing but propaganda. Catalog was furious at the Gazette. And so you were banished to the funny papers until you were sent here. What a touching tale. But now I have the means to bring this dark secret of yours out into the light. That is, unless you choose instead to give me my photograph. That may be enough to persuade me to accidentally misplace this article. Fine, you win. Here, take it, cotton pony. Yes! I am invincible! Alright, we broadcast in five. Take our positions and... What's going on here? Uh, uh nothing. nothing. What are these? <sighs> really? Really? Is this what this is all about? He started it by stealing my property. Only because you're always acting like a self-centered prick. That's enough. You both are acting like a couple of folds. I mean, how big of a deal is this photograph anyway? There's nothing to be ashamed about what you like. <sighs> cover story... I've known about your past. I never thought any less of you because of it. What matters is that you own up to it so you can trot forward 
without having to worry about looking back. Now apologize, both of you. What do you want me to do? Write some sort of letter? Now. All right, all right, I'm... I'm sorry. What was that? I'm sorry, okay? I was just so humiliated, I needed to get back at you. It was not my place to intervene with your personal problems the way that I did. Yeah, I'm sorry too, I really act like an idiot. You can have your picture back. Friends? Close enough, I suppose. Great. Now that that's been taken care of, can we please get the show on the road? But of course, I am ready for my glorious return to presenting true literature! Well, looks like everything back to the way it was. Good. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to find my intro sheet. This thing constantly goes missing. Ah! I know! The sound booth! I will find you yet! Um, which reminds me of a story. Mm. You wouldn't happen to have the latest issue of the mysterious Merdewell, would you? I've been absolutely beside myself wondering if she eludes Dr. Darkness's trap. <laughs> you know what? Come by my place later. I'll lend it to you. Thank you. Greetings, every pony and every brony, and welcome to the inventory on KPNY Radio, Ponyville's radio. And if you aren't listening to KPNY Radio, then odds are you probably aren't listening to the radio. I'm Airwaves, and today I'm here with every pony's favorite literary know-it-all, who is prepared to tell us about another work of brony literature. Thank you, Airwaves. Let me tell you, it feels absolutely fantastic to once again do my sworn duty and share true literature with our fantastic listeners. I know they have been waiting quite a long time for me to make my glorious comeback, and now they can rest at ease knowing that I am here to bring them the same intellectual and modest literary insight that they have come to know and love from me. Yeah, <laughs> you're certainly back to your old self, all right. Okay then, well, let's get this over with, and uh, what's what do you have for us today, Fringetail? Uh, hold on just a moment, Airwaves. Why is there a stick next to your chair? Uh, oh, this little thing. <laughs> Uh, Sun Effects just handed it to me and called it a polo stick. Uh, it's used in some kind of bizarre sport I've never heard of. <laughs> anyway, I'm not taking any more chances with you. Every time you come on air, something happens and it's usually to me. So, I brought this with me just for a little bit of insurance. Just to keep you in order this time around. Oh, are you actually threatening me? Is that legal? I want a lawyer! Just continue with your presentation, fairy tale, and everything will be just fine. Um, <coughs> right. So, my presentation today is in regard to the works of an author who goes by the name Pennington Inkwell. Ah, the name just exudes prominence and intelligence. Yeah, I remember the way you immediately jumped on it when uh, the name was brought up, so, uh... Tell me about this author and his works. I did not jump. I merely felt that anyone with a name as regal and refined as that must possess a skill of equal impressiveness. So you picked it because he sounded smart. <laughs> well, fairy tale, you sound more sh shallow than I thought. Shallow? I'll have you know that I possess a keen ability to discern talent from rabble with but a single glance. And as always, I was entirely correct in my assumptions. I have found that Pennington is a talented adventurer writer who specializes in the personalization of unique characters. Yeah, uh-huh. Is that what you said about the comics, too? That was a one-time occurrence. I shan't sink so low again. <laughs> Funny, that's not quite what a uh, cover story told me. Lies! Slander! He is trying to sully my good name. I don't even own Captain Equestrian Number 1. I, I mean... Uh... <laughs> uh, now that we're all being honest with ourselves... Why don't you tell us about the story that you've chosen for us by Pennington Inkwell? Very well. The story that I have brought forth is entitled Happy Adventuring Twilight, and it is an adventure story falling within a genre that the bronies refer to as self-insert. Self-insert? That sounds rather painful. Yes, well, <clears throat> oh, yeah, let me explain. We know that these bronies adore our world and society, well, it seems that many go out of their way to create their own fictional personas based around our world. 
So essentially what you're saying is they create pony versions of themselves, or as we have known to call it, ponifying themselves. I still refuse to accept that as an actual word. Now then, it is common for brony writers to use these doppelgangers of theirs as characters within their works. This is one such instance. The main character is Pennington Inkwell himself, or at least the author's glorified mental interpretation of himself. There also exists a style in which an author will insert himself as a character into our world whilst maintaining their human form. These are often referred to as human and equestria stories, but those are for another day. Okay, I understand. So, in this story, Pennington views himself as a pony already living in Equestria. I kind of like that idea. It sounds rather fun. I wonder what I would be like as a human. Well, you couldn't be any more hideous than you already are. What, what, what do you think? I'd have teal skin or something as a human? A human with your sickly green hue? That has to be the most absurd thing I've ever heard. What's next? A human with wings and a tail? I happen to like my coat color, thank you very much. And Mr. Polo Stick here would happen to agree it with me. All right, all right, I get it. <clears throat> so what does our author-made protagonist do once he inserts himself into Equestria? In this story, Pennington works as a writer for hire, taking in various commissions from other ponies to write whatever they will. But in fact, he is secretly the author of the famous Daring Do novels. Which, mind you, we have yet to discover who has actually written the books. So it's quite ingenious that he could make such a claim. So after 16 books, a comic spin-off, and a made-for-radio play, we still don't know who wrote the originals? Mm, you're a very elusive author. It's no surprise to me that the bronies themselves haven't discovered the original author. But in the case of Mr. Inkwell, this known fact allows him to insert himself as the mysterious author behind the adventure novels. And what makes his character so interesting is not the sole fact that he is the writer of the Daring Do novels, but the fact that he himself goes out on adventures that form the basis and inspiration for the books. Hmm. That's very interesting, considering Hardcover has uh, preached to me that many writers use their own life inspirations to write stories and books. But the question is, how believable are the adventures? I mean, considering since you have read the Daring Do novels, how does it compare? Well, even though Pennington exaggerates certain aspects for the sake of the story, the adventures he faces are surely fraught with danger. This story chronicles one such an adventure, a mission to infiltrate the Changeling Hive in order to observe their society as research for his latest book. That's pretty dedicated research. Almost as asinine as when Hardcover tried to make a rocket go to the moon. He what now? It's exactly as it sounds. <laughs> I can't really blame him. Well, uh, we all have times in our youth when we think we can do anything. This was last week. <laughs> uh, reminds me when I first learned how to fly. I got into all sorts of trouble. But anyway, what about you, Fairy Tale? Were you just as riveting as a fool as you are now? I'll have you know that I was quite the rambunctious in one of my youth. Need I remind you of my highly decorated service in the guard? Oh, right, the supply clerk. Yes. Such memorable times. Fairy Tale, are you okay there? Hmm, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, fairy tale. The story, you know? Can you tell us how Pennington gets himself involved with this quest to go to the Changeling Hive? Mm, right. The adventure is instigated by Twilight Sparkle. When she realizes that Pennington is the only pony in town she has never met, she tries to break the ice with him by commissioning him to write a story about a conspiracy within the Changeling Hive. When she becomes aware of his plans to go to the Hive itself and conduct on-site research, Miss Sparkle tries to persuade him otherwise and return to Ponyville. However, Inkwell's pride and arrogance pushes him forward, causing Twilight to get caught up with his risky ambitions. So, Twilight gets caught up in all of this. <laughs> but I'm guessing that this is nothing that the element of magic can't handle, you know, considering that she is a princess after all. The story takes place not long before the Changeling invasion of Cantalot, so she's yet to be coronated as an alicorn. The characters are written as literary foils to one another. That is to say, at first they are essentially opposites. The beginning chapters of the journey is filled with animosity, as the cautious and level-headed Twilight attempts to reason with the arrogant and devil-may-care attitude of Pennington, at least until the two start to warm up to each other. Warm up to each other? How so? That's the other major aspect of this story. Not only is it a riveting, globe-trotting adventure, but it also develops a romance between Pennington and Twilight Sparkle. 
a romance with Twilight Sparkle? He thinks rather highly of himself, doesn't he? <laughs> you two already have so much in common. How rude! But I wouldn't be too concerned with this tale. It is far more tame than those bizarre stories that hardcover is into. Anyway, the initial icy emotions begin to thaw as the two become embroiled in a dangerous expedition, forcing them to rely on each other. Eventually, situation has that both end up saving the other's life, at which point love begins to bloom. And as you can imagine, falling in love is the last thing you want to do before entering the Chingsman's domain. So a story that involves both adventure and romance. Sounds like there's something here for everybody to enjoy. Still, fairly typical for a mare to fall in love with a stallion after he saves her. Seems like they're always attracted to those uh, shining armor types. Right, fairy tale? Fairy tale? Hey, fairy tale, are you listening? Yes. The last thing you want to do. Um, fairy tale. Fairy tale! Completely unrealistic, really. It never turns out that way. Fairy tale! Am I gonna have to whack you with a stick? Sheesh! This thing is taller than I am! How is any pony supposed to play this polo anyway? <sighs> it seems that we are in need of a short break. When we come back, we'll continue to talk more about Pennington Inkwell's Happy Adventuring Twilight. I hope.
time it is now. If you guess commercials, you'd be right. Now, for some commercials. Greetings, everypony. This is Radio Sports on KPNY, and I am Jockey Straps with the sports. I am currently here in the Cloudsdale Coliseum, and there was an extremely fast race with the amazing Wonderbolt Derby this morning. And to top it off, there are reports of an even faster race at the running of the leaves. More details to follow later. I am Jockey Straps, and that's the sports on KPNY. Granny Smith style apples are round, green, and oh so delicious. Untouched by pony hooves, from picking and plucking to pantry. All sweet apple acres apples stay fresh for months, and our zap apple jam ain't nothing to laugh at either. Your great grandparents knew Granny Smith's sweet apple acres. This is your local news and KBNY, and I'm your local correspondent, press release. We here at KPNY and the town of Ponyville would like to remind you that today marks the two-year anniversary of the liberation of the Paris Blood Invasion. Memorial services will be held at Town Hall later this evening and will be accompanied by one Pony Polka performance. More on this story later. Details at 11. I'm Press Release. Welcome back, every pony and every brony, to the inventory on KPNY Radio. Ponyville's radio. And if you're not listening to KPNY Radio, well, then check with your doctor because you might just be deaf. So, fairy tale. Got your head out of claws down now? I apologize for my previous behavior. It would seem as though this story has begun to bring some unwanted memories to the surface. Bad memories? Do you want to talk about it? Absolutely not, and certainly not with you. Now, we have some professionalism to maintain. I was just about to account for some of the other strengths of Pennington Inkwell's happy adventuring twilight. All right, then. If you say so, go on. Thank you. Now then, as I had stated before, this story, being a romantic adventure novel, places great importance on characterization. Although Pennington does base the main character of the story greatly after himself, he avoids the temptation to over-exaggerate his qualities. He presents his pony doppelganger with weaknesses to make him more believable. So in what way does Mr. Inkwell present himself to accomplish this task? He is brash, arrogant, often uncaring for his own well-being, and far too quick to jump into danger. It is these less than admirable traits that first drives Twilight away from him. Still, it isn't long before these are the very traits that she finds the most endearing within him. He contains that successful combination of sophisticated gentle cult and outlaw that can be found in many of literature's greatest swashbuckling heroes. Well, by the sound of it, Pennington has penned quite a memorable character. Yeah! That oaf. But let me see, there's Twilight. As many of us ponies who take residence here in Ponyville have come to know, she is smart, level-headed, and rightfully prudent, allowing her to make the perfect companion to offset Pennington. Of course, her driving desire to protect those close to her can sometimes cause her to take unnecessary risks. This becomes especially true when her feelings for Pennington become ignited, which causes Pennington to occasionally grow up and become the smart one. This creates a riveting and heart-pounding dynamic between Pennington and Butterdrop. You mean Twilight? I'm sorry? Pennington and Twilight. You just said the name Butters. I did not! Fairy tale. You've been distracted ever since we started talking about the love story. Are you sure there isn't something you want to get off your chest? It's none of your business. Besides, the listeners don't want to hear such dribble. Oh, come on, out with it. You're not leaving this booth until you tell me what's on your mind. I still have the polo stick, you know. And I'm pretty sure the listeners would like to know a little bit more about you, fairy tale. So I'm sure they wouldn't mind. You are always stubborn as a mule, Cap Farmer. But if you insist, I suppose there's little point in hiding the truth. All right, fairy tale. We're all ears. Time to tell us your story. Not long after I moved away from Ponyville to start a new life for myself in Canterlot, I ran across this mare. Her name was Butterdrop. She was a unicorn socialite, had a mane like golden honey and bright inviting emerald eyes. I became enthralled by her, constantly dreaming of the day we could be formally introduced. So, did you ever talk to her? What'd she say? Why, well, was never given the opportunity to converse with her. I mean, what would a regal unicorn like her have anything to do with a lowly earth pony like myself? 
Oh, just because she might be from a classy background doesn't mean that she wouldn't give you the time of the day. I don't see why you're so hard on yourself. It wasn't the class that had anything to do with it. I had, I had always been frail, even by Earth Pony standards. And growing up, I was constantly teased of such. So most of my youth, I spent my time locked away in my room, reading novels and playing make-believe with my literary idols, such as the inquisitive Captain Blackmane, the brave Sir Lancebunch, and the heroic Sergeant Stampede. Yeah! I remember hearing of those stories. <laughs> such great classroom classics. I only got to read Sergeant Stampede in the Everfree Expedition. I naively believed that I could become like them by becoming one of Canterlot's elite. Then I would be able to impress Butterdrop as the greatest soldier in Equestria, and I wasn't going to allow my frailty to become a hindrance. So you're saying you got into the service to impress a mayor? Yes, but my plan backfired. I'm not sure how much you know about the inner machinations of the guard, but there's a prominent bias towards the mobile and athletic pegasi. They're the ones who ever get to see real action. Unicorns are usually left to personally guard the castle grounds, while we earth ponies are shuffled away into menial manual labor. It didn't take long for my instructors to realize that I, even, I wasn't even cut out for that. So, they hid me away behind a desk in logistics. So, your supply clerk job? Yes. With no signs of promotion in sight, I quit the service after nearly a year. Naturally, I tried to regain my composure by trying to pursue Miss Butterdrop. You see, it was the thought of her that kept me going while in the guard. But alas, when I finally approached her, it was too late. She had already married a wealthy Pegasus merchant. So you had lost your opportunity? Very much so. My life went gray that day. With nothing left, I returned to school and dove into my studies at Cantalot University, where I earned my degree with relative ease. That's where I met my good friend Hardcover. His kindness helped me overcome my chronic stream of failure. Especially as he pushed me to apply at the Royal Archives. Even though he can be a tad bit excitable, I can see how he cares for you as a friend. Yes, and then if not for him, I would never have met Sound Effects, the one who helped me get at my job at the first municipal book depository of Cantalot, after my application was originally denied. Admittedly, I was devastated from the denial, but Sound Effects told me one thing that I have yet to forget. Don't ever be hard on yourself. We all end up just exactly where we need to be one way or another, so don't give up on yourself. I feel inventing over 41 times so you don't see me rolling around in the mud crying. It was 12! From that day on, I decided that I would never again let my inferiority gain the better of me. I was not going to allow any unicorn or pegasus to outdo me. Then I realized, being in the guard, I had the will of a soldier. And through my schooling and the work in the depository, I had the intelligence of a scholar. I set myself down a path proving that even an earth pony like me, even with my setbacks, deserves the recognition. Well, it is good not to be put down by others. You know I appreciate that. And then, one day, sound effects dragged me in hardcover from our jobs to show us his newest invention. The QED. Yes. And when we both saw what it could do, I knew my day to prove myself had come. And that's when you decided to join the inventory. Funny. All this time, I thought you were so stuck up because you felt yourself superior to everybody. But in the end, it was quite opposite, wasn't it? You just wanted to prove yourself. And then you showed up and stole the spotlight. You, a Pegasus who had fallen from grace and was working a meaningless Earth Pony's job. You were the one given the chance for redemption, not me. This was never about me, was it, Fairy Tale? You were mad at yourself. You couldn't forgive your own weakness and try to hide it with arrogance. I suppose now you're going to berate me and tell me how cowardly and pathetic I am, right? No. You know what I think? I think you've been spending way too much time feeling sorry for yourself. And it doesn't matter if you're an earth pony, a unicorn, a pegasus, crystal pony, dragon, or whatever. There's nothing stopping you from being just as good, if not better, than any pony else. And you don't need some Medal of Honor, massive intellect, or impressive title to do that. You just need to be you. you just be me, eh? You know, I've never talked so much about myself before. Thanks for listening, Elves. I feel like I needed to say these things for a long time. I just never knew it. Sometimes it takes a friend to show you who you really are on the inside. 
that's something I learned from the rest of you guys. <laughs> Confound it, look what you've done! You were planning on embarrassing me like this from the beginning, weren't you? <laughs> I think now would be probably a good time to end the broadcast. Thank you all for listening, and if you love adventure and romance, please be sure to check out Pennington Inkwell's Happy Adventuring Twilight. And if you enjoy that story, there are some numerous sequels and prequels that Pennington has uh, written starring his ponified self as well. This is Airwaves, signing off. Say goodnight, fairy tale. No, you still are a low level carrot farmer. And you're still a stuck up librarian. <laughs>
cover story found outside the booth. Well, if you ask me, it sounds like some pony's trying to frame our cover on purpose. Frame me? Who in the world would want to frame me? I think I might have a pretty good idea of who the pony responsible is. Gather every pony together. We need to have a meeting. 